we're going to get through this. Yeah, it is hard. And it is a lifelong thing that you're going to have to deal with. But we have so many ways that we can support you. And um, what do you need? That was so much good (laughs) advice and tips in there. Um, Mm -hmm. Sort of from a teacher's perspective, how is that for you working with accommodations? And what's your view on it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, accommodations are uh, ways that we can um, change something to be able so that the learner can show what they know um, without being held back in, in any way, without being restricted in any way. So accommodations take so many different forms from uh, preferential seating to uh, often it's said, um, you know, move those students closer to you, which generally works. And a lot of those kids in the middle school who have dyslexia diagnoses will sit in the front. I see them all. (laughs) They're just right there in the front, which I appreciate. Um, But some students need to sit a little farther back. Um, I remember your daughter is one of those. She was able to really dig in and listen best without being in the front. She really needed to sort of sort and sift through things, synthesize things with a little more distance. So as a teacher, again, it's really knowing that student um, and figuring out where does that student need to sit in order to be the the best learner they can be. So an accommodation might be as simple as where that student sits to um, making sure they use voice to text, um, uh, getting text to um, a voice for that student. Um, there might be um, a study buddy, note sharing. Um, so many of these things are pretty simple to do with just a little bit of organization and forethought. And every educator owes it to that student, to those students, to make it work. So if I think a, a teacher um, says, well, it's just not going to work in my classroom for whatever reason. I really believe uh, that it's the, the family, the parent's job to really get in there and advocate um, until the student can do that for the for students can do that for themselves. Um, so the advocacy and accommodation, those things go hand in hand um, after it's acknowledge, advocate, accommodate. So really acknowledging what that student needs, set up the accommodations, and then really make sure that those are followed followed through at school. So I believe that um, almost all accommodations can be done pretty easily in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. I think um, too often we hear from from teachers um, that it's just not practical that they have Mm -hmm. too many students to to be able to individualize um in the Mm -hmm. way that that we sometimes or that we often feel like we need them to um Mm -hmm. you know when when our students have learning differences um i guess uh any any additional thoughts on on sort of that practicality aspect like how Mm -hmm. to how to um properly individualize instruction for people with learning differences while still maintaining a cohesive classroom or or whatever? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it definitely is uh, a challenge and there needs to be planning um, from the teacher, possibly a special ed educator, um, a counselor, really getting together to figure out what that student needs and then figuring out a way to make it happen. And if there are five accommodations, figuring out what the most important ones are and making sure you do those, um, which could be always voice to text, for instance. Um, That is pretty easy to do. You just need a laptop and a quiet spot. Um, And then later as a teacher, you check in, you see how the spelling was. Did you spell check? Did you run it through Grammarly? Um, And uh, then you're having a one-on-one conference with that student. And it really is important for every um, student with dyslexia or learning difference to have assessments um, uh, at least three times a year for writing and uh, three times a year for reading at least. And we're using in the middle school right now the uh, curriculum-based 
uh, measurement CBM for writing um, writing uh, samples um, and reading. We are using Dibbles and the Dibbles Maze, um, and so that gives information to the to the teacher. And I think flexible grouping is really important. So it might be hard to um, figure out how you're going to talk about uh, paragraphing with a group. The, the whole class doesn't need it, but these four students do. So you have a quiet group over here working with that while the other kids working on vocabulary, silently reading, working on an essay. So I do believe that with creativity and forethought that it's possible to work on those accommodations and make those happen. Yeah. And of course, talking about all these challenges, sort of on the flip side, you know, I think people often think of dyslexic students as not good at language arts in general because of the yeah. challenges. But I'm wondering, mm -hmm. as a language arts teacher, what you've seen about actually strengths in that area. Yeah. Yep. So many. Um, I even jotted a few notes. Um, the, and I'm just generalizing, but kids who have dyslexia are so clever and creative. Their brains have to go through different routes. They're, if they're looking at a word compared to someone who doesn't have dyslexia, they're looking at a word and they're making meaning of that word. And then they go to the form. Someone who doesn't have dyslexia I can look at the word farm and I say F-A-R-M, boom, where a student with dyslexia needs to make meaning might think or see farm, a farm, and then goes to the phonemes of the word. So um, the, the students are bright, their brains are so interesting, and I always want to let them know, I'm so curious, what is going on in there? Talk to me about what's going on. And often the self-awareness and the creativity and the um, the just the sense of who they are and how they learn best becomes so um, finely tuned. Um, so I also want to let those kids know um, that they have sort of a superpower that helps them look at the world in a new, fresh way. And when they talk to other learners in the classroom about how they think about a topic or a concept, it just enriches the conversation, it enriches the community. And I really believe that the demystification of this, um, of dyslexia makes, um, it just brings us uh, so much value to the community because there's um, just a deeper understanding of the ways that we're all similar and different. Um, so um, challenging, let me see if I have some of my notes here. Um, so the ways that, um, here we go, um, just thinking about how they can, um, kids who have dyslexia need to have their brains challenged. They need to be challenged because their intelligence isn't related to their dyslexia. So we need to get them the challenges that they deserve, that they have the right to. So that might mean that they're listening to um, an audiobook because that reading level and the conceptual understanding is at a high level, but being able to decode that text is not there yet. So um, reading aloud to students in class is important. Families read at home, continue no matter what. They're 35, they're coming back for Thanksgiving, have a reading, talk about something, talk about a poem, talk about a passage, a paragraph. Um, being able to um, uh, just access the language in that student, having them talk um, to you about what they understand, um, gives you a sense of what they know and the depth of their understanding. So. Um, these kids are bright and creative, and they bring those things to the classroom while um, they deserve to be as challenged as we can challenge them.
It was a ramble. It was a big old ramble, <laughs> but I got it out eventually. <laughs> um, no, there's a lot of uh, a lot of really good points there, actually. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I really, I really like, particularly um, your point about about making sure that you're giving them challenging enough material. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that's that's something that we kind of preach on this on this show on Dyslexia mm-hmm. Journey, um, and I think that still as a society um people have have some struggles recognizing that Mm -hmm. Um, the misconceptions yeah uh, and the myths hold don't they of um well they're just they see things they don't see things right like the rest Mm -hmm. of people or um it's related to intelligence or it's just numbers and letters backwards those those myths just Mm -hmm. do persist even though it's becoming less and less um but with challenging those students, that's where the accommodations come in and are so key. Um, so if a student, um, uh, like if you as a teacher are giving a multiple choice test, um, you need to accommodate for that student to have um, maybe a voice to text, maybe writing a short paragraph to show what they know, even having an interview with you. So being able to get that uh, sense of understanding from that student's brain out is what's most important. And as an educator, finding that way, finding that route to having that student share what they know is, is really key. (laughs) Now I was just going to say that, um, that I think it's helpful just hearing all the context here because it's like, we're, I'm able to hear sort of these different techniques, right? You did mention, you know, sort of having the side group of the people who need to work on on the paragraphing, you know, so I can hear that piece, but it's like going along. I think the point is it's going along with the other things. You can be doing both. You can Mm -hmm. be doing the part where you're catching them up and you can be doing Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the parts where you're helping them demonstrate their higher level knowledge too. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's, that's exactly right. And I think, um, talking, going back to the trust and the relationship student to teacher relationship, having that student know that you know who they are and that they've got this, I think is so important to, to talk about that on a weekly basis of you're working so hard right now. And you just did a voice to text five paragraph essay in 20 minutes you just transcended space and time. What were you doing in the library? Congratulations. Um, And now what we can do is let's work on revision and editing and just individualizing where that, where that student is. But uh, I I do really want to uh, emphasize that um, the importance of the student being known and that they know, you know, who they are and, Don Graves, a writing teacher who uh, I took classes with in grad school, had this really interesting um, uh, challenge for the educators in this class. He said, from memory, write down every student that you have, just from memory, and then write next to every student something you know that they're really good at or that they have as a passion. Now, put a check mark by those students' names who they know you know that they're good at that. So if we're thinking about someone who does cyclocross and I want to be able to talk to that student about cyclocross, how was that race over the weekend? I see you've got a big Band-Aid on your knee. Is that from cyclocross Um, or is that from your puppy or your little sister? Or So really being able to just uh, talk about what they know and that they know that you know is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, that's so key. I think for um, really, really for anyone, I mean, regardless of of learning differences, I mean, feeling seen in school um, by your teachers um, sort of for feeling seen for, for who you really are, what your interests are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, I think goes so far in, um, establishing trust and then and then leading to sort of positive learning outcomes Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right yeah and there will be hard things and it's going to 
I, I want most of the time reading to be pleasurable um, while growing competency and fluency and comprehension. And then sometimes it's going to be complex and it's going to be really hard, but just communicating that we're going to work on this together, that you've got your team here. And um, I, I do believe that one of my goals as an educator is to help my students find their voice and not just writer's voice, but their, their inner voice, their uh, self-advocacy voice, being able to communicate if there's a conflict, being able to um, be a, an active vocal person in the community, whether that's their family, their classroom, their school, their city, the country, the world, beyond. Um, so I think I really believe how communication is key, and I want students to be able to um, know that they can code switch and talk to a lot of different people and communicate on the page and communicate um, orally and uh, that they can do that with confidence and competency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also really key, I think, for people with dyslexia um, who don't often, I think, or sometimes can feel intimidated um, mm -hmm. by speaking in school settings or in more formal settings, um, speaking and writing and just sort of expressing themselves verbally. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's important to make that link. Yeah. Between life skills more generally too, mm -hmm. I think um, you've offered so much here with us, uh, just wisdom and insights from all your experience. I'm just wondering as we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share or any final words? Hmm. Um, let's see. I really, uh, appreciate the opportunity that you've given me here to uh, examine my practice and to consider students I've had in the past and um, sort of dream about the students I'll have in my future. And you've helped me sort of um, redouble my belief in the importance of all the things that we've talked about, accommodating, um, doing accommodations, interventions, communicating, the parent to school uh, pipeline, I'll call it, um, and the triangle of student, family, school, student, family, school. Um, so the importance of communication and all of those stakeholders, I think, is something that I would like to leave everyone with. Don't stop talking. If you're a parent, don't stop advocating and inspire and encourage your child to work on that. Uh, upper elementary, middle school definitely can start advocating for themselves. So uh, I think just keep that communication going and don't stop until you get what your child needs. Uh, thank you. That was All right. Yeah, Thank you. So we really appreciate your um, wisdom and mm -hmm. um, and your uh, willingness to share that with with us and with our audience. Great, and so Thank much you. experience, so many years of experience you're sharing with us too. So it's really helpful, mm -hmm. and I know mm -hmm. your audience yeah. too.